Uh, thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. And uh, thank you to Rich and to Chris. Uh, wonderful to speak to you this, this morning. morning. Um, everybody has trouble with that name. It's Omanika. Uh, people think of the omen, so it looks like Omanika. People think of Neka. Uh, the, there's a number of different things, but it's, it's actually pronounced Omanika. It's the name of the mountain range within which it resides in British Columbia in Canada. Um, we're pretty excited about where we are right now with this company, and I'm going to advance through things fairly quickly as uh, I just have a short time. Uh, standard forward-looking disclosure statement uh, you're familiar with. And uh, share structure, very briefly, 136 million shares outstanding. Stock trading at about 15 cents a share. So this would be one of the companies that Rich talked about yesterday that uh, pay attention to what happens in the future here because uh, we're early in the mining cycle and we're a gold exploration and potentially development company. Uh, if uh, in the warrants, or excuse me, in the capital structure, if all of the warrants and options were exercised, that would bring about $7.5 million Canadian into the Treasury. Uh, we're well financed at this moment for the first uh, exploration season this year. And uh, not on that slide is it, uh, well, no, I'll skip through it because I don't have time to get into it. But uh, what we have is a project in cent south central British Columbia. We're in uh, mining country in the Caribou in British Columbia. The Caribou Gold Rush starting in 1860 was one of the largest placer mining gold rushes in Canadian history and we're in that area. And there's a lot of gold still in the ground in that area that hasn't been developed and I'll talk about why. Uh, a couple of observations about our land package in the two yellow circles we just added to our package. Now that's for the exploration program for load sources of gold, so bedrock sources of gold. But part of this talk is about our immediate placer development activities with our partner on the project. So we have a, a very big land package. When you look at us there in blue, we've got uh, 66,000 hectares, or roughly the equivalent of 250 square miles of ground. And yet we look small compared to our next door neighbor to the east of Cisco Development Corporation. They have over 2,200 hectares, and uh, their land, that means that their land package is about 800 square miles in size. Uh, we've looked uh, worldwide and that is the largest, their project is the largest contiguous gold exploration land package in the world. It's just that big. Uh, and they're big in the Caribou for a reason. They came on the scene in 2015 by taking over a company called Barkerville Gold which had developed some historic gold mining activity in the area. They consolidated the region. Osisco has been doing tremendous work. They've developed in multiple deposits, a total of about six million ounces so far of relatively high grade material and it's our estimate uh, that they're probably very soon on their way to 10 plus million if not many, many more millions of ounces in that camp. They're very busy. They've had up to 50 geological staff on site, 10 drill rigs turning last year. It's probably one of if not their biggest exploration project in North America and we're the next door neighbors in blue there. Now in the early days of their project, uh, our working group were finance uh, part of the finance group that helped fund the early exploration on their project starting a quarter century ago. And we're now doing the same thing down the block, so it's a, again a go back in time kind of scenario where we're doing the same thing that we were involved with funding years ago in real time on the other side of the mountain range. We're about 25 kilometers from the center of their project. Uh, what are we doing? Uh, very quickly, an interesting historic placer gold development project. You can see that schematic there that shows a, a decline running down into the into rich pay gravels underneath Lightning Creek. So when we look at that slide, we've got a 550 meter decline shaft that goes down to the pay gravels that are about 50 meters underneath Lightning Creek. Uh, they were placed there by where Lightning Creek used to be millions of years ago. So if you can envision the river cutting through the mountainsides, eroding gold, the gold settles to the bottom, it's now on bedrock in the bottom, and as time passes, further erosion causes the elevation of the creek to rise. And so it's now 50 meters higher than it was millions of years ago when it was in place in gold in the bottom of the creek bed. So a few implications there. One, it's hard to get at. To mine placer gold, normally you see people panning gold in riverbeds or dredging uh, near surface to recover gold. It's hard in this scenario because it's in a steep canyon underneath an active creek. So that means that it's technically challenging to mine. However, we know that it's a very rich deposit, so it makes it worth the effort. The other implication is that steep canyon that has a bunch of gold at the bottom, th is the implication is that that gold didn't travel very far. And uh, I've got a couple of uh, slides that will 
show that. So in 2012, we went in and bulk sampled this thing. So we went down the 550 meter decline, it's about a third of a mile uh, to the bottom of it. We froze a cross cut going across the paleo channel. So we went perpendicular to it, cut across it, and we froze it because we wanted it to be stable and safe to investigate the character of the gold in that paleo channel. Uh, we were very pleasantly surprised with the outcome. You can see on the top left the highway that runs parallel to Lightning Creek. Uh, so we're mining right under the creek, right under the highway uh, in doing that investigation back in 2012. The very last slide in that chain shows us recovering gold in the recovery room in the assay lab on a riffle table. So that's the character of the gold that we got out of it. This is a picture of the underground workings in 2012. Simple wash plant that you might see on television up in the Yukon. Once you've mined through bedrock and into the paleo channel, it's a gravel recovery. It's a conglomerate that's been compacted, but it mines quite easily. Uh, you can recover it, run it through a wash plant underground, so the ore, if you will, never leaves ground, underground. It stays there, and you bring up a concentrate and literally a 10-gallon pail up to surface to further process to get all of the concentrated gold out of it. Uh, it's a simple process, but again, remember, technically challenging because we're under Lightning Creek, so the area is saturated with water, and that's the number one thing that has to be managed. We did that by freezing. Uh, in real time now, we've got a partner group that is going to do it a different way. Uh, they found a way to do it uh, with more efficacy, meaning that it's going to last longer, it's probably going to be safer, and it's going to be cheaper. So there's 173 ounces of gold that we recovered from one simple crosscut in 2012. Now, once we did that, we put the project on the shelf because shortly thereafter, the gold price had declined dramatically, went through quite a bottom of a cup and handle formation, and it's coming up the other side. So literally a decade later, well, two years ago, we pulled it off the shelf, but a decade later, it's time to exploit this opportunity, and that's what we're doing now uh, with a partner group. So there's a few things that uh, really get us excited about this. These are current photos from the underground uh, workings that... Uh, our partner group has developed. Now, this is a dated photo already. There's quite a bit more activity. We struck a deal with a group called Lightning Creek Mining Corporation. In fact, they're a, a mining group out of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, where we're headquartered and where I'm from. That We've got a long history of working with some of the operators in that operation. And the deal we struck with them is because we're, we're financiers. We're not miners, but we work with miners. Uh, the deal we struck with them is they will bring all of their equipment, personnel, engineering, consumables, mining equipment, uh, everything that's necessary to rehabilitate the site and start developing to investigate the promise of this thing. And for that, they get to keep half the gold that they recover right out of the gate. Whatever, if they get two ounces, they keep one, they give us one. And on our half that they give us, they're going to bill us 850 Canadian per ounce. So it's a fixed price contract for us with them. So they take on all of the project development risk we can be viewed as simply a company that owns a royalty, a very large royalty on a project that professional mining group is, a professional mining group is going to develop with us. Uh, they're doing that as we speak. There's, uh, you know, right now Canadian dollar gold is about $2,400 an ounce. So that very first ounce that our partners deliver to us, we're gonna make about a $1,500 Canadian profit on it and every, their ounce, every ounce thereafter that they deliver. They're happy to do that because they get to keep half the gold that they will recover. So on the right-hand side of this slide is the, uh, it's a 3D seismic reflection survey over the first 300 meters. The area in red is the first crosscut that we did in 2012. And again, this would be mined out had the gold price not gone down so dramatically over the last decade. But, uh, or at least it would have been attempted to be, I guess, is a fairer statement. But uh, that first cross cut in red is 80 feet long, 8 foot wide, 8 foot high. So picture a tunnel that's 8 feet wide. 80 feet long, 8 foot high. And there's a really important point I like to make. When we did that cross cut, we got 173 ounces out of that. So it's really about the twice the length of an average house trailer. Every yard of advance that we went forward in that, on average, we got about seven ounces of gold. I mean, it's extraordinarily rich, and our lead geologist, Steve Kosas, has characterized it as one of, if not the richest, placer gold deposit in BC history that remains unmined. And again, the reason for that is it's technically challenged uh, or challenging. Mining was attempted in the 1930s using traditional technology of cribbing with timber sets and invariably they would hit pay gravels and be excited and then within a few days or weeks 
the walls would turn to toothpaste because of the moisture in the environment down there. Next thing you know, you're up to your ankles in water, and before you know it, you're leaving the mine. So it was abandoned in 1939 on the, at the eve of World War I, and quite frankly, nobody went back at it with any serious attempt to try it until 1991, where a group that was doing what, you know, the same thing over again ran out of money trying it. So what we've done is gone a more, let's call it, professional approach to this. My background in mining and mining finance involves helping my father develop the longest running gold mine in Saskatchewan history, the CB Gold Projects, which is still in production 31 years after it went into production in 1991. We look at things and we try to do them as technically possibly or technically capably as we can. So we've brought in the right engineers, the right mining group, people that we've got a long track record with, so let's do this right. So they're underground right now doing that. This is just a, uh, a plan view of 2.4 kilometers showing historic drill fences. Uh, they're a little hard to see on there, but basically this deposit has been known about for over 100 years. It's just nobody's had the wherewithal to go attack it with, in our estimate with the right attitude, which is do things slowly, do them right, do them once, get the gold and be done. I took this picture last week underground. Uh, that's Ken Hamilton in the picture. He's the CEO of Lightning Creek Mining Corporation, our partners. I <laughs> took it on purpose because it shows him on a cell phone. He's 15 stories beneath the surface at the bottom at the mining face and he's on a cell phone because I love technology now. You can have land, you know, the equivalent of landline. We've had a Zoom meeting down there uh, with uh, standing at the mining face. You couldn't do that even 10 years ago. So technology is, is really advanced. So is mining technology. Now, one of the things that they're doing differently, this is the underground drill at the mining face. So they're, they're drilling holes into this thing to put a grout curtain over top of it. Basically, you drill a series of holes, roughly several inches in diameter, across the channel, put a steel pipe, BQ, in this case BQ, uh, drill rod in it, fill both the rod and the, the area around it with grout cement, which is cementitious grout, and leave it. And essentially you're building a cage over top of the area you're going to mine. And then as you mine moving forward, you're going to use shotcrete that you spray on the walls, which is simply a fiber reinforced cement that you spray that sets up almost instantly. So you'll mine a little bit, shotcrete it, mine forward. It's a tunneling uh, excavation project. And uh, this is the mining machine that they will be using. It's brand new. They got it built in Maryland. Uh, this is when it was delivered in uh, early February. It's got a rotary cutting head on a boom that extends 28 feet that can do up to, you know, probably six or eight meters wide. But basically, they're going to mine in 12-foot passes. So they'll mine 12 foot wide and probably about 12 feet high. Grinding through, again, shot creating, grinding, shot creating, all the while doing that, recovering gold and running it through an underground wash plant. So it's a fascinating uh, project. Over the last 18 months that they've been active developing this, we've run into everything that you've heard about in other discussions here for supply. We've had, in no particular order, in the caribou flooding up there uh, with the more rain in 50 years, which when you're in a wet environment under Neath Lightning Creek, you want to be sensitive to that. So we had massive flooding in 2020, uh, forest fires thereafter, supply chain disruptions caused by COVID and a Canadian trucker strike. And you could, uh, there's a lot of other things that they've run into, but they've managed to push the project forward to the point that they're now on the verge. This is underground mining activity right at the doorstep of the potential gold bearing gravels. They managed to push this thing forward to the point that uh, we're pretty excited about it. So you tunnel to the mining face, where the gold is, you, then you make sure you set up with grout to be able to go under it safely. You excavate it, and then once you, literally on that right-hand slide there, within three feet of the end of that tunnel, there is paleoplacer gold. Paleo just means old, placer means gold found in riverbeds, so an old riverbed filled with gold, if you will. And uh, we proved that it's very rich in 2012 when we excavated that 173 ounces from one 80-foot long crosscut. I mean, that's an extraordinary result. This is the current wash plant that they've uh, constructed and set up underground. It's right in front of the original crosscut. You can still see the freeze pipes that we left in the ground there when we froze it. And the freeze technology we used to do that uh, initial crosscut was hockey rink technology, the same pipes that you use to make ice in any hockey rink in North America. Uh, it was a safe way. Current energy prices probably mean that it's not the best idea. Uh, it could be economic, we don't know. They're not going to find out because their engineering staff has determined that they would rather put permanent cover by using cement grout rather than have temporary cover uh, with uh, frozen ground. 
So all of that's interesting, and we're literally on the doorstep of them breaking in and starting to liberate gold and, and report back to us with how much is our share. And we haven't said much in the marketplace because we're publicly traded, and the, probably the most important news release we'll put out in any time in, in the near future is that they have started recovering gold, ergo we are seeing cash flow. So our stock's drifting along sideways at 15 cents while people wait for that moment. Uh, if it works out the way we expect, it will be a big moment for us. But there's the other implications about this story, and I know I don't have a, a whole lot of time, but I want to cover something. When they're grinding their way through to the, the paleoplaster deposit, they have to cut through the bedrock to get there to start. And we're already seeing interesting mineralization. We, we see bornite and calcopyrite in there and other sulfides that are indicative of an epithermal gold system. So that big land package that we've got, 660 square kilometers or roughly 250 square miles, that's not about placer gold. That's about where did that gold come from that ended up in the creek beds. And we think we know and we think there's multiple opportunities to develop hard rock load deposits on our ground. And already we're seeing indications of that. In 2012 when we did that bulk sample, on the top slide is, an, is one of the larger nuggets that came out of that. We learned some things that nobody knew up until right now, which is uh, the historical record didn't talk about the character of the gold that was recovered in the 1930s when they attempted this. But we looked at that nugget and others like it and just got excited like you wouldn't believe. That's what's called autochthonous gold. Autochthonous meaning adjacent to. So when you find a nugget that's hackly like that, it hasn't been worn by the streams, it hasn't, it hasn't been in any way deformed really, and it still has quartz clasps within it and around it, that broke off the wall rock, literally that one probably within 50 to 100 meters from where we found it in the placer. So the implication there is we could be right on top of the actual source of the gold that we're developing. As we go forward, we look at that and say, wow, let's uh, find that out. There's two streams right there. Uh, the one on the right is Williams Creek. That's where our neighbors are working. That was one of tied with our Lightning Creek for the two richest creeks in the Caribou Gold Rush and our land package straddles our Lightning Creek. We have identical geology. We're on, when you look at that slide on the right, that's the mountain range that was formed. Uh, it's called an orogenic gold system, and what happens is as the earth squishes up and creates mountains, it's like two hands on an accordion, where the two hands are pushing on the rocks. Those are the limbs of the anticline that's created. That's where the gold is found, because it creates a perfect environment for fluids deep in the earth to come up adjacent to those hands, and create gold deposits in the rock. And then Mother Nature erodes them away and puts them into the creek beds, and that's how you have placer deposits. And in our case, nobody ever found the load sources of the rich placers in Lightning Creek because nobody was looking. So I'm gonna skip through some of the geological stuff that I had on here because I don't have time. Long story short, our area was never exploited for bedrock load sources of gold because they never finished trying to exploit the Lightning Creek deep paleoplasters. There was well over a million ounces that were taken out of Lightning Creek at surface and slightly below surface, but never searched for the hard rock source. And part of that is because the terrain is simply, it, it's covered with glacial till and on top of that is evergreen trees that are shoulder to shoulder and devil's club thorn in the bush in there. And basically what that means is it is miserable for a, a geological explorationist to go in there and try find anything. Only 5% of the bedrock shows up that you could actually go look at it. So you have to use modern geophysical techniques, which we've done. That red area that you see on that right-hand slide is about 500 meters up the hillside from our placer workings. Oh, I guess you, I've, I've got the wrong slide up here. That red area is 500 meters up the, the hillside from our underground placer workings. That's our primary target area for the potential source of that gold. And we've developed that by using modern geophysics to isolate it, doing groundwork over top of it, and we have a very high level of confidence that when we drill that area, we should find something interesting, since our underground mining crew is already running into interesting min mineralization as they cut through bedrock. Uh, another area to the, about eight kilometers to the northwest of our underground, there's a picture of the geophysics that we flew over that. We're in the process of doing ground geophysics now. So that slide on the left uh, really shows us the kind of stuff you're looking for in that Basically, we have a deposit up there called the Toop Deposit, about a kilometer to the west of that fancy-looking pretty picture. 
uh, that they also never found the source of the gold for it. They didn't look very hard for the reasons I just stated. It's just really hard to explore in the caribou, but modern geophysical techniques allow us to look through the rock better than ever before, find areas of interest, target them with boots on the ground to do ground geophysics, and then ultimately drill test them to find out what the rocks are telling us. All of these things are going to happen this year in Amanika. I like ending with this slide. This is the point of where this all starts. That was taken in 2012 when our project manager, Len Sinclair, and our lead geologist, Steve Kosis, were recovering gold from that 10-gallon bucket they would have taken to surface from the original crosscut. And our mining partners at this stage are on the doorstep of starting to recover gold. Hopefully that happens in the very near future, could be weeks from now, hopefully certainly over the summer. When they start doing that, they won't stop because they're incentivized because they get to keep half the gold. Whatever they recover, they'll keep half, give us half, and we will uh, move forward with our exploration program. Both of those things are underway as the snow comes off the hillsides up in, in Canada and in British Columbia. So big story. We're next to an elephant in Osisco development. We know the area because we've been both funding the original exploration that they're working on now for over 25 years. We've got a, plas a potential placer recovery program, and we've got done all of the geological work to give us three really good targets for this summer's drill program as to, you know, where did some of that low gold come from. So I'm going to end on that note. I love that slide. That's real gold that gets recovered on a riffle table. And uh, if there's any questions, be happy to answer them.